Hello, Jeff. Good morning. And thank you so much for joining me today. It's Friday. I know that you, uh, you, you're probably very busy. You have lots of classes you are teaching, lots of grading to do. Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure, Ekaterina. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak about this important topic. And um, thank you very much. Yes, of course. Well, Jeff, uh, let's just start with some quick introductions. And I have a series of questions that we kind of will cover and everything is very informal. So feel free to skip the questions if you don't like them. You're the guest. Great. Well, I'm Jeff Harris. I am an assistant professor of project management here at CBC. I've recently joined CBC from 34 years of corporate professional experience in the high-tech industry. Mainly, I've been focused on running high-performance teams in the software, hardware, and systems designs area. And I've worked at uh, companies such as IBM, Motorola, Intel, and Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin. In the uh, last 25 years, my main focus has been in senior leadership roles with direct project management, experience and opportunities to run projects and also run project management offices. Well, um, that's just amazing. So why did you leave corporate world? Why did you decide to work full-time in academia after 34 years? <laughs> what yeah, happened? So, so actually it's all about following my true passion. My true passion has always been teaching. My plan has been teach at the college level. And that's a big reason why I even went and got my postgraduate degree was because that was going to be required. So my plan was once I gained enough professional experience, I would leave the corporate world and follow my true passion and that is teaching. So, you know, here I am excited to be here on that goal. I admire when people follow their true pa passion. I, I kind of remember my also years of experience working uh, in different institutions. And uh, for me, it's, all, it's also all about following my passion and teaching. At first it was teaching. I was a part-time faculty and then a little bit of full-time. And then I uh, moved into management and learning and development. And now I do uh, teaching, but it's more of a training. So for me, I, I totally understand following your passion. My next question to you is you have 34 years of experience in corporate world. Now you are teaching your students. You are full-time faculty at CBC. How do you make these connections between corporate world and classroom experiences? Uh, so how are they intertwined? How do you incorporate this into your teaching? Well, well first off, I treat this as something that is absolutely necessary. It is very necessary to intertwine these real life experiences into the classroom. It's what I feel the most valuable asset that we as instructors bring to the college students. You can learn the material and the theory and, and learn how to teach it. But again, having these experiences to be able to connect the dots for the students are really, really the key. The, the theory, don't get me wrong, is extremely important. It needs to be taught as well, but it's the dots to the students so that they see how these, how these theories are used in practice within the classroom, within the real world that, to make the connections. So what are, they re what are your students' reactions when you bring those real life experiences and share maybe some examples from your, from your experience working in the corporate world or some, something that maybe your colleagues are still having some challenges and solutions that they're developing? So how do your students react when you bring those experiences into your classroom practice and um, what, do they, what do they think? Well, I can tell you that the easiest way for me to grab their attention, maintain their attention, is when I start talking about the real life experiences. If I'm not careful, my entire classroom time can be spent just talking about uh, these real life experience questions because students are very, very interested in knowing what to expect in the real, in the real world, in the, in the workforce. 
And by giving them these real life experiences, it's painting that picture for them. And, and like I said, this is what they really want to understand. I'm in class, I'm learning all these things. What will I expect to have to do when I'm out there in the real world? And so they're extremely interested in that. They have a lot of questions on that. And that's what I really, be, I, I really enjoy. When these questions come in, um, you know, I can always tie the theory to try to answer the questions, but it's nice when I have an actual example that I can pull up and I can say, well, we tried that, that didn't really work very well, this is why, or we tried it, and yes, and this is kind of a best practice. So to answer your question, the reactions are like really strong, very interested, and it's, it's, it's an attention grabber for them. Well, I, I, uh, I absolutely like 100% agree with you. And um, I, if I were a student again, I would only care about how it is in the real world. Yes, theory is important. It's always important. It's the foundation. But sometimes in certain industries, things are changing so rapidly that I think there's such a, a tremendous value in knowing how it is in real life now, what challenges this industry experiences now, and how I can prepare for these challenges so that I can find a job after I graduate and, uh, and I'm, I'm marketable and, you know, employers are lining up to hire me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's wonderful. So, Tell me maybe about some specific examples, because I know a lot of uh, faculty are listening to our podcasts. So there is always a question about how do you get started with uh, finding those experiences, real life scenarios uh, and examples, and then incorporating them, but probably finding them. How do you come up with them is probably a uh, number one question that I always hear from faculty when, when we talk about the connection between the industry and the classroom. Well, so I've been fortunate to have worked on many very diverse projects from the very, very small to the very, very large commercial projects, as well as government projects. So I have a large database, so to speak, with all these different experiences. And just to kind of highlight a few of them and how I bring them in, um, let's talk on a large scale. So I spent seven years working for Motorola on a six and a half billion dollars called the Iridium Project. And basically it placed a constellation of 66 satellites into orbit around the earth. And the goal was to enable voice and data communications anywhere on the earth. And it turned out not to be a big business success for Motorola, which again, there was very a lot of learnings from that. But from a technological standpoint, it was a marvel. It was a technological marvel. That constellation of satellites is still flying today after 22 years. And there's so many lessons that I can pull from Iridium, again, being such a large uh, program, hundreds and hundreds of lessons here. There's good ones, there's bad ones, and there's ugly ones. Um, the, the, the main theme of, okay, because I mentioned it wasn't a big moneymaker for Motorola. Mot Motorola actually had to go and sell this system for pennies on the dollar, dollar now the company that's running it now is doing very well with it. But for Motorola, it, it didn't do well. And the lessons learned there was, you can't take too long to bring technology to fruition. Mm -hmm. When it was conceived of 10 years prior to commercial activation, it was a wonderful idea. But taking 10 years to bring the project online, by then the world changed. Technology moves at a very fast pace. So that was a really great lesson, and I bring that into the into the classroom. You know, the world moves forward at a very fast pace, and you have to get your technology there quickly. Um, on a much smaller scale, I used to run engineering design service double design centers, and I, I owned the profit the profit and loss responsibilities for them. Now, the interesting thing there was it's very entrepreneurial. And I have a lot of students who are really interested in running their own businesses. Mm -hmm. So when I start talking to that level where now you're, now you're running you know, all the projects yourself, you're owning all the resources, you're responsible for the financials and the business side of it, that they really perk up to that because they're thinking that's going to be them in the future because they want to run their own businesses. And um, I spent 11 and a half years at Intel. 
working for Intel brought a lot of very interesting experiences because I had a lot of different roles there. And it's good for this to relate to Intel because they all know that their microprocessors that are running their computers are from Intel. So that kind of gets them excited about that. But um, Intel allowed me to, you know, do some really challenging pro uh, projects. And it also um, made to run different project management offices. So there's a lot of experiences that I can bring that how to manage project managers, as well as just being a project manager and driving the, uh, the projects yourself. Um, another big uh, thing that I draw on is my IBM M. That's where I was first introduced to Six Sigma quality. And I'm a very, very big uh, advocate of quality practices. I learned the importance of quality and what quality can do in terms of improving your products. I learned about the, what I like to call the Goldilocks zone of project management processes. You want to, you, you, you don't want too much process. You don't want too little process. You want process that's just right, just the right amount. So IBM brought all that to me. And one, one other big area that um, I, I draw on is my experience with government contracts. So when I worked at Lockheed Martin, it gave me great, great experiences working on these really large government contracts and the thing I loved about it, and this was early in my career when I was still a young engineer, <laughs> um, I, it showed me how powerful project managers can be. The way that Lockheed Martin ran their projects at that time, these government contracts, the project manager was in charge of owning that project from cradle to grave. He owned all the budgets, the customer relationships, everything. I've never seen such a powerful project management model than I saw Lockheed Martin when, when it was you know, in, in the government realm. So those are just a sampling of the number of uh, uh, experiences that I, that I pull on on a regular basis into the classroom. So you are tapping into your uh, personal experiences when you were working in corporate uh, world for 40, uh, for 34 years. So you accumulated so much knowledge and experience and all the things, and now you're sharing them with the students. Question number one, uh, how do you keep up with the uh, new developments? Because I feel like project management, IT, everything is changing so quickly. And if you are not in it right now, what you knew, say, five years ago, or I don't know, uh, seven years ago may, may be very different. So how do you keep up with the current trends? You know what's new and how to present this information to the students. And the second question, and you can just answer them in whatever order you, you feel like. And the second question, how would you recommend your uh, peers, colleagues, your colleagues, other faculty to start thinking about real life examples and experiences if they've been disconnected from corporate world or the industry? First and foremost, again, because I talked about how important it is to have these experiences and bring them into the classroom. You have to be able to keep up with these experiences. And there's several things that I do to do that. First off, I have like 700 contacts on LinkedIn. So I'm always keeping an eye on what my colleagues are working on out there and staying in contact with them, networking with them, finding out these new things. Because that was a concern I had was becoming kind of stale with my information. I yeah. wanted to make sure that I could stay current. So things like social media, staying in contact, you know, LinkedIn for me is, is one of the primary ways that I do that. There's also, um, I'm, I'm PMP certified. So I have a, a project management certification from the Project Management Institute. And as part of that, I'm required to take training and stay current in my field. So that also pushes me. And, and through the PMI website, there's a lot of opportunities for me to learn things, stay at state, state of the art, take classes, things of that sort. And I also make sure that I'm always using the internet to my benefit in terms of following the latest developments understanding where the new trends are heading and, you know, reading the articles and staying up on, on all these things. Like, for example, I know that artificial intelligence is, it's starting to play a very big role in project management and the whole discipline, and it's going to have a much, much larger role in the future. So I am researching anything I can find in that area in terms of artificial intelligence and how it can apply to uh, us as project management practitioners doing our job better. It's, it's, it has a huge um, 
uh, benefit that we haven't totally sunk into yet. So that's definitely ways that, um, you know, I'm still staying connected and getting these relevant experiences. But in terms of advice that I'd have for faculty members, I, I'll just pause for a second in case you had any questions on that. No, no, it's, you know, keeping up with the current trends is key to success for any professional. And there are industries and fields where um, trends are evolving and changing so rapidly. If you're not keeping up and say you paused for a year uh, for whatever reason, you're like, wow, I'm so behind. But there are other industries that are not uh, changing that quickly so you you know it's, you don't have that pressure to to keep up constantly I, I really like your idea of uh, keeping in touch with professionals from your industry on LinkedIn and maybe at the end you could tell us a little bit about some strategies you're using to keep in touch with with your uh, colleagues or you know people in the field and how do you do that? So that's kind of a segue. It's it's very interesting. Maybe we'll just leave it towards the end, but that's one of the questions that I would like to kind of talk a little bit more about. Okay. Well, I do have several things that we can talk about in terms of advice to give faculty members about creating these real life industry experiences for their students. First and foremost, I think what helps is if you consciously think about the need to weave in these experiences as you're creating your assignments, that's the first step. So you're always thinking about, okay, how can I bring my experiences into the classroom? That's the first step is always have that mindset of understanding the importance and the value and have the mindset. But when you do it, you need to make it fun. You need to try to use humor and you absolutely need to involve the students in the learning, mm -hmm. involve them. So one thing that I really like to do is I like to explain a real problem from the corporate world that I had worked on. But before I go in and give the solution and talk about it in detail, break the students into work groups and then, you know, have them work on it. And then after they've worked on it a while and you've heard their thoughts and everyone's gotten to kind of present, then you can give them the real outcome. Like one, one, one example is um, that I like to do is I like to tell the students, okay, we're gonna break into groups. Pretend like you're the CEO of Intel. And would you put out a line of Intel branded computers like Dell and Lenovo, Lenovo does? You know, would you wanna do that? Why or why not? And I give them time to think about it. And so from the, the real corporate answer is, you know, Intel CEO would not do that because he would be competing with his major customers like Dell and Lenovo. So the second Intel would start putting out their own computers, their big, their big customers would start complaining and they would even threaten to go to the competitors, you know, go to AMD, go to, go to you know, find compu uh, computer parts from a different source. So that's one reason why, you know, Intel wouldn't want to do that, but you'd want the students to think about that first on their own. And this lets them, you know, really get into that kind of mindset. Um, also, like we talked about, it's very important to keep the experiences fresh. So you wanna pull from recent articles and make sure that um, you're bringing the latest and greatest into the classroom and staying up on that. But I wanna remind you not to forget the oldies but goodies, because there's some that never seem to go obsolete. These are ones you want to showcase them and, and, and show because they're so prevalent and they're so important. A good example that I like to pull up, and this is from the early 80s. So Microsoft and IBM got into a teaming agreement regarding Microsoft developing DOS for IBM. The terms of the teaming agreement were so favorable for Microsoft that it launched their business. So I like to, in my project procurement class, use this case study because it allows the students to really understand the power of a teaming agreement and how important it is to understand the terms. Because in this particular example, I won't go into too much detail, Microsoft <laughs> did very, very well. And I think IBM would really have liked to have rethought that whole situation. So, so even though we want the latest and greatest things, there's still some great examples to pull up. Even my Iridium example, where 
you know, from a business standpoint, it wasn't a, a you know a good situation for Motorola, six and a half billion dollar project. So you want to make sure that you know you're not overlooking these these ones here. But a good way to find the latest and greatest things is to seek out these videos and the podcasts and articles and websites that are showcasing these real world experiences that are within your field. And then you can supplement your course with these materials. It makes a, uh, you know, a really big difference. And like we talked about keeping up with your, your uh, colleagues, understanding what they're working on from past jobs and inquire what they're, you know, what's the next project they're working on? How are things involved? Hey, remember that project we worked on together? How would it be different using what your new technology here and being able to kind of extrapolate from all that and we need to be looking for these innovations in the field and you know, bring them into the classroom. We wanna make sure that we're seeking uh, guest speakers and experts, you know, have guest speakers come into the classroom, find experts in the field who will come into the classroom and talk and you know, make sure they're still active in the workforce and that will bring very relevant topics in. And uh, lastly, I'd like to discuss, you know, seeking out partnerships with the corporate world. So you can, you know, find those, those companies that are interested in hiring your students and you have these partnerships. So not only will they sometimes provide guest speakers and things of that sort, but it opens up a pipeline for your mm -hmm. students to be able to, you know, work at those companies. And then they can understand what, by bringing, by bringing in people from those companies, they, they'll understand what it's like to work there before they even work there and what types of uh, things that the project managers do in those areas. So that sort of thing is really important. So those are just some of the ideas off the, off the top of my head. Really about. Well, these are really wonderful ideas. So many uh, interesting insights. And now I have a question about, okay, so as a faculty member who are new to uh, perhaps teaching, uh, teaching and learning and I'm trying to create a repository of different real life scenarios and examples. I am connected to uh, other professionals in the field. I use LinkedIn. I have uh, some guest speakers lined up who can come and do uh, presentations and talks on different topics. The question I have is how to create those learning experiences in my classes, specifically if you're teaching online. Would, would you um, share some examples how you create those activities, assignments, Zoom classes? What, what do you do to develop those assignments and activities in your class? And even when you mentioned um, having students, so when you present students with a problem, then you have them work on the solutions in groups. So how do you do this online? Tell us about your strategies that work um, in your classes. It's, it's certainly more challenging to do it online for sure. But luckily, Zoom does allow breakout groups. Mm -hmm. So you can set up the, the assignments via the Zoom breakout groups. The students can go off and do their, you know, have their little sessions and then come back. And then you can also go around and check in with them as they're going through it. But, but in general, bringing these experiences into the normal um, assignments is, is, to me, it's a standard practice. So it's, it's, it's standard, you, you, set up a, you set up an assignment and you just make sure that you're weaving into it, you know, real life kind of scenarios and you're bringing things in from the real life. You because like record then, it? Uh, do you do like video, short video recordings to talk about these examples or it's kind of in writing? So, so yes, being very detailed in the instructions on, on what to expect, mm -hmm. right? And, and yes, there's videos and everything that, that are also going along with that to explain it. And then having the students perform the assignment, and that's just if it's a regular assignment. And then I'll always do like a weekly wrap up message at the end of the week and I can give, you know, okay, this is what I saw in the assignment. Here's what really happened during the corporate, the real corporate experience with this. So I can, I can brief it that way, but those are on assignments. I do the same thing with discussion boards. Mm -hmm. The same, it's just, you know, the assignment is a part one. And then I have the students reflect upon 
the other students' responses. They have to give positive and constructive feedback on the other students' responses in the discussion board. So this is getting interaction between them going, which is, which is really good. And that's if you don't have you know, Zoom sessions and everything set up, at least the students can interact via the discussion boards, being it online. Of course, much easier, much more effective if you're doing this in the classroom setting. So it does make it more challenging and the interactions aren't quite at the same level, but it still is extremely effective. Well, something that you uh, said about peer reviews, when you ask students to critique and evaluate their peers' work, I think that is actually aligned with the project management core principles and soft skills that you as a project manager must have in order to be successful because you know you need to understand teamwork you need to understand engagement you need to understand how to evaluate how to critique how to how to work with your peers in the team setting i think what you are doing is actually uh developing helping students develop those soft skills yes it's not like hard skills, it's not knowledge, knowledge, but these are the soft skills that will make them very successful uh, when they actually start working in, in those companies. So I really like your approach and um, that's, that's wonderful. I think it's absolutely key to have the students be comfortable doing these peer reviews. Mm -hmm. And I make it very clear, they don't get credit if they just say, hey, I really like what you said. Or they said, I don't have any you know, constructive feedback. This was great. They won't get any credit for that. Right. So even on the positive, I want them to be finding things, you know, more so than, oh, I like this color, or I like this format, or I like what you said, but very specific. Now, where they struggle is the constructive feedback. It, they struggle it's tough. a lot on that. And some students, um, uh, it, it takes them a little time, but it's interesting to watch. The first couple of discussion board assignments, Everyone's kind of, you know, a little bit, you know, what can I say? What should I say? What can I say? And then after three or four of these, they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're really giving it to each other, which is wonderful because as project managers, you have to be able to give not only the positive feedback, but you have to be able to give the constructive feedback as well on, on this. And, and so it's teaching them now. And I do get feedback from students. A lot of them absolutely love doing this. They think it's part, the most fun part of the class is all this interaction. And there's others that absolutely hate it. They're very, very uncomfortable giving the feedback, especially the negative feedback. But I keep reminding them how important this is. You're in a leadership role and you are gonna be evaluating your teammates in, in, in the real world. You have to write reviews and it's wonderful when they're all glowing and people are doing phenomenal, but sometimes people are struggling. They need a little help, they need guidance. You have to be able to provide that. It's part of the job responsibility. So the more you practice it now, the better you get at that skill now in this nice and cold, you know, and nurturing environment, the easier it's going to be later on. And I know that that resonates with them and they understand. But um, yeah, most of them really like it. And there's some that, you know, they're just very uncomfortable with it. Well, and it's 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 very common. It's, it's, it's always uncomfortable to uh, give feedback, especially if it's not negative, but um, <laughs> constructive, constructive, right? And so how do you do that? But I feel like in your courses, you not only do you teach project, project management and the principles of project management uh, and share real life experience, but you also uh, develop your students to be future leaders. So it's the leadership development that is critical. I feel like this is such an impo important component. And it's it's not just for project management. I think it's any discipline. Now, if you uh, can be a leader, and when I say leader, it's not just manager. You know, management and leadership are not synonymous. You, it doesn't mean you don't have to manage people to be a leader. So I think that's clear. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that too much. But those leadership skills, soft skills, communication skills are vital. And that what will that's what will make a student stand out. And that so now the question I have to you is how do you help your students with um, developing portfolios? 
so to speak. It doesn't have to be formal portfolios, but how do you uh, help them prepare for that moment when they graduate and they start looking for jobs and they need to learn how to uh, advertise and market themselves to a potential employer? And that is a resume, your LinkedIn profile, but also many employers now want to see samples of your work. And if you just graduated, you don't really have those samples, but I feel like what you are giving your students in your courses, they can put together in a portfolio that can showcase their soft skills, their communication skills, and even some work on some projects that you do in your courses. So talk a little bit about that. How do you go about it? And how do you help your students highlight your uh, their skills and achievements? Well, one thing that I do to really help them and prepare them for the real work world is to give them the tools that professional project managers use. I like my assignments to be very, very hands-on. The students are learning how to generate like scatter diagrams, how to use Excel to do um, supplier selection where you put different criteria and you weight the criteria and you determine which supplier should you, you know, should you use based on their proposal inputs. Um, generating tools like cause and effect diagrams, generating Pareto charts, generating control charts. And these are all, these assignments are all, these are they're pretty in depth and they're things that they can take to a job interview and say, look, I am proficient using this diagramming technique. I can use Excel to do this. I can you know, generate these types of, of tools. And, and we step through the entire project management process where we start with generating project charters and then scope statements. And then we generate a work breakdown structure. And from that, we generate an activities list and we do budgets and we generate a schedule and we do risk management and have a risk register. So these are all, and lessons learned that we do, these are all tangible things that they can actually take and say, look what I learned in this program. We took this actual, this actual project charter from a real project and we took it all the way through all the steps. So these are things that they can bring to that, to that job interview. Now, I think we, we should be doing more things like how do you interview? How do you um, generate a resume and things of that sort? But at the moment, that's kind of outside the, 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 the actual uh, assignments that they're given. But anytime a student comes to me, I do sit down with them and I will go over all those types of things that are very important. I also worked as an adjunct professor at Portland Community College. And when I was there, I had a lot more opportunities to work with students in like resume workshops. And I actually did some uh, mock interviews mm -hmm. where if they were, wanted to interview for a real job, they, if they brought me the job description, I would look that over and I would pretend like I was actually the hiring manager, you know, based on that criteria they gave me. And I'd have them walk out of the room. And then when they walked back in, I was the hiring manager. And they would be sweating during the interview because it was like the real thing. And then after they, they finished, you know, I have them, I thank them and I have them leave. Then they come back in and I do a full debrief and tell them, wow, I think that really went fantastic. Here are the things I think you really showcased. Here are some things that maybe you'd want to reconsider doing in a real interview and helping them. And then there's been feedback that that has really helped them when they actually went for the, the real job. So I think things like that we can do based on our corporate experience, and, and many of us have you know, hired hundreds of people ourselves in the hiring manager role, can help students be more successful when they, when they get out there. And that's again, reviewing resumes and things of that sort. We know what hiring managers are looking for. We know what sort of skills to showcase. We know formats of resumes that work and ones that are a little more difficult to, do, to, uh, you know, to deal with. Maybe sometime in the near future, we could launch a project like this to help Love students. To prepare for for real world after they graduate because real world is really tough and um, looking for a job is a challenge it's it's for everyone it's not just for graduates everyone feels like it's getting more and more difficult to find jobs secure jobs I think um teaching students the skills within the program or maybe outside of uh, a specific program just as a like a series of workshops for students I think that would be really beneficial for, for our CBC students. Those mock interviews 
mm -hmm. I, I think are a really powerful tool to enable the students and it builds their confidence and it, and, and it gives them a better, better chance of landing that job. Yes, absolutely. And even using LinkedIn, I know so many recruiters look for professionals through LinkedIn. So paying attention to your LinkedIn profile, creating a, a profile that highlights your experience, even if like what you said, if even if it's a coursework and samples of the uh, work that you uh, students have done within their courses as part of their assignments, it's still really important to showcase on your LinkedIn profile because this important is how and important not to have things out there that are not going to help your case. I right. warn students about their social footprint. Absolutely. The students that have their Facebook pages and the social media pages with things that a potential employer may not find amusing. Mm -hmm. So I warn them about not doing things like that. And the light bulb goes on and they start taking things down because they, they never connected the dots that the hey, employers actually look at all these things. And if they see you in an unflattering way, they're gonna, they're gonna pass up on hiring you. I mean, yeah. the, the reality of it. So you have a social, social media footprint out there and you need to protect that and be very careful with it. So that's, again, something important to instill in the students. Well, it's been such a wonderful conversation. I learned so much from you, and I hope that um, other faculty will also get some strategies and ideas from this uh, podcast, from this interview. And um, I just uh, thank you so much for finding time on Friday <laughs> to, to talk about your teaching strategies and how you connect corporate and academia and how you bring those experiences uh, to your students and in, in the classroom. So I know we'll talk more. We'll probably end up doing more podcasts on other topics. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed You're our welcome. conversation. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Ekaterina.